my dear brethren and sisters and young people. Again, in a rather remarkable way, our subject this morning, which is taken from the 34th chapter of Ezekiel, beautifully summarises the previous studies. We learned from our first session how that Esther carefully heeded the instructions that were given unto her. And because she carefully heeded the instructions that were given unto her, she was found acceptable in the eyes of the king. And in the second section, we were, the point was emphasized that we should be followers of God as dear children. It was pointed out that we should be imitators, that we should be followers of God. And why should such an expression be used? Because in the Old Testament, Yahweh is set forth as the great shepherd of Israel. In the 80th Psalm, verse 1, he is described as the shepherd of Israel. And it is the duty of the sheep to carefully follow the shepherd. So the Apostle Paul emphasized that exhortation that we should be followers of God as dear children. And both the sessions have emphasized this principle that we must heed the voice and follow in the footsteps of the shepherd. Now in the chapter that is going to engage our attention this morning, this 34th chapter of Ezekiel, we have what is perhaps one of the most important exhortations that the scriptures of truth can present. Here is a chapter that you will need to analyse very carefully for yourselves. A chapter which I earnestly suggest you should go to the trouble of marking up. It is a most important chapter and divided into three sections. From verses 1 to 16, there are set forth the responsibilities of the shepherds of Israel and the failure of these shepherds. In verses 17 to 22, there are set forth the responsibilities of the flock and the failure of the flock. In verses 23 to 31, there is set forth the promise of the good shepherd and what he will accomplish. And this chapter should be studied in the light of many other chapters in the scriptures, but particularly in the light of the 23rd Psalm, a psalm with which we are all familiar, and the 10th chapter of John with the parable of the good shepherd. Now Yahweh is the great shepherd of Israel. He is the master shepherd of Israel. And those shepherds, the priests and the leaders of Israel, that were put over the care of the flock, were under shepherds over the flock. But Yahweh was the chief shepherd. And in the 78th Psalm, he speaks in this way and reminds the people of Israel how he had led them like a shepherd. Psalm 78, verses 52 to 55. He made his own people go forth like sheep, he guided them in the wilderness like a flock. He led them on safely so they feared not that the sea overwhelmed their enemies. He brought them to the border of his sanctuary, even to this mountain which his right hand had purchased. He cast out the heathen before them, divided them in inheritance by line, and made the tribes of Israel dwell in their tents. And so he led them through the wilderness. He destroyed all the evil beasts out of their way. He prepared for them the pasture and he brought them into the fold. He was the great shepherd overshadowing the destiny of his flock and leading them on like a shepherd. And in the same psalm, verses 70 to 72, we read that he chose David also his servant and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the ewes great with young. He brought him to shepherd that is what the word feed means. Shepherd Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. And this man David, the shepherd in Israel, as he looked after the ewes great with young, as he cared for the sheep that was placed under his care, as he destroyed the lion and the bear that would attack them, as he patiently endured everything for the sheep under his charges, was learning the lessons of life, a lesson that enabled him to become ultimately king in Israel and lead his people. And so the shepherd boy became a king. And the things that he learned as a shepherd boy helped him to lead his people as a king. 
And we are called to royalty in the call of Christ Jesus. This 34th chapter of Ezekiel should be studied in the light of the many types of Jesus Christ found throughout the scripture. Men who were shepherds, men like Abel the shepherd, Joseph the shepherd, Moses the shepherd, David the shepherd. Remember how that Moses went out and he was going to lead his people. The time was premature and he went about it the wrong way. And he was driven from Egypt for 40 years in the wilderness as a shepherd. He learned patience. He learned these qualities that were required to lead his people. And when he went back, Moses was a different man. He had learned the lessons of life. And now he led his people out of the land of Egypt. He was the shepherd. The shepherd at that particular time. Now what did a shepherd have to do? The shepherd had to endure much for his sheep. He had to live sparingly. He had to accustom himself to hardship. He had to brave all variations of climate. He had to give his first care to the flock. He knew little of the joys of true companionship except the animals about him. And those animals he guarded resolutely in time of danger as David did the lion and the bear. And a shepherd in Israel, in spiritual Israel, must learn those lessons. What are the sheep? On page 17 of the notes that you have, we have outlined from the book, The Land and the Book, by Thompson, the qualities of the sheep. And apply these lessons spiritually. The shepherd goes before, not merely to point the way, but to see that it is practicable and safe. He is armed in order to defend his charge. And in this he is very courageous. Some sheep always keep near to the shepherd and are his special favourites. Each of them has a name to which it answers joyfully. And the kind shepherd is ever distributing to such choice portions which he gathers for that purpose. These are the contented and happy ones. They are in no danger of getting lost or into mischief. Nor do wild beasts or thieves come near them. The great body, however, are mere worldlings intent upon their own pleasures or selfish interests. They run from bush to bush searching for varieties or delicacies and only now and then lift their heads to see where the shepherd is or rather where the general flock is, lest they get so far away as to occasion remark in their little community or rebuke from their keeper. Others again are restless or discontented jumping into everybody's field, climbing into bushes. These cost the good shepherd incessant trouble. Then there are others incurably reckless who stray far away and are utterly lost. I have repeatedly seen a silly goat or sheep running hither and thither and bleating piteously after the flock only to call forth from their dens the beasts of prey or to bring up the lurking thief who quickly quietens its cries in death. And there are many silly goats in the ecclesia. Now that is a very complete picture of the duties of the shepherd and the flock. And this chapter is indicting the shepherds and indicting the flock. If we're going to set ourselves up as leaders in spiritual Israel, we must follow the duties of the shepherd. We must know what the qualifications of the shepherd are. Now in my notes I haven't set those out in detail. I'm going to repeat them to you quickly. If you want them again, you can ask it in the question session. Now here are the qualifications of a shepherd. They're worth taking down. They're all contained in the first part of this chapter in Ezekiel. Number one, he must instruct, rule and lead the flock. Verse two. No good a shepherd saying, well I'm going to preach to you, but don't do what I do, do what I preach. A shepherd, a true shepherd, must practice what he preaches. He must instruct, rule and lead the flock. Verse 2. He must inspect the flock to seek out the sick and the weak. Verse 4. He must manifest skill in attending to them. Verse 4. He must reveal care and concern for straying sheep. Verse 4. He must assume complete responsibility for the flock. Verse 10. He must seek out good pasture. He must protect the flock. And he must lead the flock. 
not drive it where it wants to, doesn't want to go. You see, there are different types of shepherds. In Israel, the shepherd led the flock. He led the flock and he spoke to the flock. He had a pipe and he piped his way along and they listened to the music that he gave and they followed him and they knew him intimately. In Australia, we employ dogs and the dogs bark at the heels of the sheep and drive them where they don't want to go and they worry them and give them fear. And very often in the ecclesias, there's plenty of dogs doing that. A few shepherds leading the way. And that was the indictment of this chapter. Notice how the, the shepherds of Israel are indicted. In verses 1 to 6, we have the failure of Israel's shepherds. And in these verses, the prophet indicts them for what they did. Verse 2, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord Yahweh unto the shepherds. Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do shepherd or feed themselves. Shouldn't you look after the flock? You eat the fat. You kill. You kill them that are fed. They selected the fattest of the sheep and they fed on those fat sheep. They slew them and ate them. That is the picture. In other words, the shepherds of Israel carefully sought out the rich in Israel and then they fattened themselves on the rich. They played them with tributes and tithes and everything else and they took all they could from the rich and they applied it to themselves. The thin, miserable sheep, they let go where they liked. They had nothing anyway. So there was no virtue in looking after them. They looked after the fat. And that was what the shepherds of Israel were doing. They looked after the flat, fat, but they fed not the flock. And so they were looked after themselves, but the bed, they fed not the flock. In verse 4 we are told what they didn't do. The diseased, or the weak, as it is read in the Revised Standard Version, have ye not strengthened. <laughs> this is what a shepherd should do. This is the duty of those that would stand upon the platform today in the spiritual Israel. The weak have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that was, which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again with that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty you have ruled over them. And that was the attitude of the shepherds in, the, in Israel at that particular time. They should have manifested the qualities of Yahweh, the chief shepherd. But what are his qualities? Beautiful qualities of mercy, reflected in the 147th Psalm, verse 3, where we read these glorious words. He healeth the broken in heart. He bindeth up their wounds. And there we have the chief shepherd, healing the broken in heart, binding up their wounds. And these shepherds in Israel should have reflected the qualities of the Father in that sense. And what was the result of all this? The failure of the shepherds. We don't need to look at Israel after the flesh. Let's look at spiritual Israel. What was the result of all this? Verse 6. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth and none did search or seek after me. They were like silly sheep. I don't know if you've had anything to do with sheep. I was put on a farm at one time by my father, whose rule I never dared to, to, to uh, oppose. He made of me a farmer and a shepherd. The sheep didn't think much of the idea, and as for the pigs, they all died within two weeks. <laughs> but I did learn a little bit about sheep, and you know, often the sheep will select a leader among them, and they'll follow that leader. And they'll follow that leader to death. That leader only has to jo jump over a high wall and the others all follow jumping over the high wall until there's a heap of dead sheep. They'll do that. They'll follow whatever they want to do. Now that is what we have here. There was no shepherd and no one to lead them. These are all sh silly sheep and they're going everywhere because there's no shepherd to raise a voice and say, this is the way you should go. And so the shepherds are indicted in these first six verses of this chapter. And in verses 7 to 10, there's a terrible judgment poured out upon these shepherds. You see, brethren and sisters, when we come to a Bible school and we absorb this word of truth, there's a bounden responsibility that rests upon each one of us. Now, that is the sum total of what you're learning this week. That is emphasized in the story of Esther. Wasn't there a responsibility resting upon Esther when the queen had selected her? Could Esther go about and do what she wants to do her own way? Had not she come to comply to the laws that were imposed upon her? Of course she had. 
So what about the brethren in Ephesus? Haven't they strict laws that they had to follow? Strict principles that they had to apply? That's the lesson of Scripture. And if you want to know what Esther was trying to do, she was trying to reveal characteristics that would please the king. And what is Paul calling upon the Ephesians to do? Manifest characteristics to please the king. And what are we here for? On service to the king. On service to his royal majesty. And every one of us has been called to that end. Now when we absorb the word, there's a, there's a great responsibility that we stand for a standard of truth in the ecclesia. That we do the very principles that are set out here that the shepherds of Israel were called upon to do. And so in verses 7 to 10, there's the judgment that shall be heaped upon those shepherds because they fail to do what Yahweh required of them. Notice what he says in verse 10. Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. There you see, a person to be a shepherd, and he can say, well, I understand the word, and I'm walking in the word. I'm doing everything to develop myself in the way that the word will show. That's not sufficient. That's purely selfish. It's introspective. I want the kingdom. And I'm going to get that kingdom. All right, now this is the way you do it. You act the part of a shepherd. You lead the others. You've got a care and a responsibility to your neighbour. You just can't live in a centre on your own. You have a responsibility to others. We were told this morning that we are the multitude of this Christ. Can I chop off my hand and put the hand down there and let that hand go along and play like as if it's there? Can I chop off a leg and the leg will go walking away? Of course it won't. So we've got a duty one to another. And that is what Yahweh was impressing upon the shepherds of Israel. Now he says, I'm going to require my flock at their hand. In ancient times, a shepherd not only looked after the flock, but it was his duty to bring that flock to its owner without any loss. And if there was any loss in that flock, the owner required it at the hand of a shepherd. Now when you turn back to the 31st chapter of Genesis, you have one shepherd telling his owner how well he looked after the flock. In the 31st chapter of Genesis, verses 38 and 39. This twenty years, says Jacob, have I been with thee. Thy ewes and thy she-goats have not cast their young, and the rams of thy flock have I not eaten. That which was torn of beasts, I brought it not unto thee. I bear the loss of it. Of my hand didst thou require it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. And there was the duty of the shepherd. So that any sheep lost, Jacob had to make a good to Laban. And Laban was that kind of considerate, kind master that would certainly say to Jacob that he wanted every sheep and he wanted it well accounted for. Now that's the duty of a shepherd. You can see the responsibility resting upon a shepherd. They are a tremendous responsibility. And so in verses 7 to 10 of this 34th chapter, the judgment of Yahweh is centered upon those shepherds. And now in verses 11 to 16, God says that as the shepherds have failed, he will look after the flock himself. And he says in verse 11, Behold, even I will both search my sheep and seek them out. I will search my sheep and seek them out. And the word search here in its Hebrew form means to tread, to frequent, to follow, to trace the steps of one. And that's what Yahweh's going to do. He's going to trace out the steps of his wandering sheep and bring them back. The word seek, on the other hand, is a Hebrew word meaning to plow. And when you plow, you lay open the ground. So what he's going to do is going to seek out his sheep and then he's going to open up the hearts of that sheep for inspection. And he's going to see what those sheep are like. And he's going to do this, he says in verse 12, as a shepherd seeketh out his flock with the greatest care and diligence, gathering them together, counting them, bringing them into the fold, looking after them, caring for the, disease, the, the, the weak among them. Yahweh is going to do that because his shepherds have failed. And though the shepherds may fail, Yahweh the chief shepherd will not fail. 
And so he goes on to speak of this in the subsequent verses of that section of this chapter. Now this is very comforting to the members of the flock. You could well imagine in the days of Ezekiel, as Ezekiel got up to about verse 16 of this chapter, how that the members of the flock would say to themselves, that's perfectly correct, the shepherds haven't looked after us. It's not our fault that we are scattered. We can blame it onto our leaders. Have a look at the ecclesia. Don't we say the same thing? Don't we indict the leaders? Don't we say that the leaders are responsible for the state of things that exist in the ecclesia today? Don't we exonerate ourselves because the leaders are doing this, that and the other? They're not playing the part of a shepherd. We speak like that very often. I've heard it quite frequently. I may have been guilty of the same sin myself. And now Yahweh deals with that. He comes down to the flock in verses 17 to 22 of that chapter. He's dealt with the shepherds, you see. He's indicted the shepherds. He's proclaimed his judgment upon the shepherds. He shows how he himself is going to take over the work of the shepherds. Now he comes to the flock. And he has a look at the flock. He looks at the ecclesia. He looks at each one of us. And he sees a certain state of things of the ecclesia that is displeasing to him. And he says in verse 17, And as for you, O my flock, thus saith the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I will judge between cattle and cattle, and between the rams and the goats. And he shows that this flock has got goats in it, and it's got sheep in it, and it's got various kinds of cattle in it. And he speaks to the goats, and he speaks to the big cattle, and he speaks to them in verse 16. Seemeth it a small thing unto you to have eaten up the good pasture, but ye must tread down with your feet the residue of the pastures, and to have drunk of the deep waters, but you must foul the residue with your sheep. I don't know if you've ever seen animals in uh, that, uh, in, in, as it is described here, but you will see a powerful beast born out of the way, a weaker beast. It'll get the best of the pasture, horning out of the way the other cattle, and it'll eat up that pasture. Then it treads down all that pasture. There's no grass left for the rest of the she- uh, animals. Or you'll see sheep go to a dam to drink water, and it'll tread into the water, and it'll foul that water with its feet. The weaker sheep have to come along and drink the fouled water, or they have to eat the grass that is trodden down. And the big animals couldn't care less about the little ones. The big animals would burn them out of the way and destroy them, would tread down the pasture or foul the water, and that's all that's left for the wheat. In other words, there's no care for one another. And he's not talking about animals. Does God care for oxen, says Paul, or does he speak this concerning you? And the answer is obvious. It's concerning us. And we can go through the ecclesial line completely independent. We can say, right, we're going to study the Word of God. I've heard this repeatedly. I'm a study, I'm a student of the Word of God. I couldn't care less about the weaker ones. Let them study. Let them read Eureka. Buy Young's Concordance. Study the Word of God. Mark up their Bible verse by verse. They don't do it. So, the pastures stamped down. And we indict the weaker ones of the flock. And we foul the waters. And then we wonder why the poor things are starving for nourishment. And there is a responsibility upon the flock, upon the greater ones in the flock. And when the shepherds might have failed in their duty, it's a responsibility of those in the flock to help the weaker among them. That's the lesson of Ezekiel chapter 34. This is the chapter, a prophetic chapter, of the coming shepherd king. And so he speaks of that flock in, the verse, uh, in these verses. In verse 19 he says, As for my flock, they eat that which ye have trodden with your feet, and they drink that which ye have found with your feet. Yahweh says, that's my flock. He says, I'm going to come and judge between these two classes of people. Those that are fouling the water so that the weak among them can't drink it. Those that are stamping down the pasture, ruining the principles of the truth so that they can't eat it and gain nourishment. I'm going to deal with them because I'm the master shepherd. And I'll handle that matter. And I'm going to see that these here are my flock. And I'm going to take them. And I'm going to help them. And he goes on in verses 20 and 21. Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat cattle and the lean cattle, because you have thrust with a side and shoulder, and pushed all the wheat with your horns, till you have scattered them abroad. How much of that is done in the Christian life today? How often do we listen to that? You get brethren in high position, 
arguing as to whether revolution is a fact or not. You have them saying, we don't need to study the word. And Fifteen years ago, I used to be indicted because I used to say, study the work of the pioneers. Today it is, why do you say we've got to study the Bible? If we live the truth, that's all that's necessary. They're fouling the waters, they're stamping down the pasture. They're, they're goring with their horns, they're thrusting with their sides. And that's what's indicted in the 34th chapter of Ezekiel. And we can face up to it or we can leave it as we like. But the chief shepherd knows, and he says, I'll handle this matter in my own good time. And he says in verse 22, I will save my flock and they shall no more be afraid and I will judge between cattle and cattle. And then in verse 23, on to the end of the chapter, we have the glorious promise of the shepherd prince. Now here you have one of the most dramatic incidents in history because this shepherd prince is going to battle with the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Shubal. And that's the drama of these chapters. The shepherd prince is going to battle with the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Shubal. And in verse 23 he says, I will set up one shepherd over thee, the good shepherd. When the Lord Jesus Christ came before the Jewish people and said, I am the good shepherd, any Jew educated in the scriptures would know what he was talking about. The 23rd chapter of uh, uh, Psalm, the 34th chapter of Ezekiel, the 10th chapter of Zechariah, all prophetic of the good shepherd. I will set up one shepherd over them and he shall feed them, even my servant David. The word David means the beloved. Here is his servant, the beloved. Remember what the voice from heaven said when the Lord Jesus Christ was uh, baptized? He called him the beloved. My son, the beloved. That is how those words can be rendered. And here he speaks of my servant, the beloved. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Not then David that is in mind, but the Lord Jesus Christ. He shall feed them, he shall be their shepherd. And I, Yahweh, will be their God, and my servant, the beloved, will be a prince among them. He took David from the sheepfold and made him king. And virtually he does the same with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in the succeeding verses of this chapter, we are told what the Lord Jesus Christ is going to do. In verse 25, there is a covenant of peace, first of all. The word peace, in its Hebrew form, doesn't mean merely the cessation of war. It doesn't mean the fact that one is not fighting against the other. The word comes from a Hebrew root, which means to be at one. Now we're at peace one with the other when we can enter into the same hopes and aspirations as each other. When we are of the same one mind, then we're at peace in the Hebrew sense of the word. When you visit Israel, they use this word shalom. They meet you with that word. And yet there's no real peace in that land. Because the true meaning of that word is not merely the cessation of war, it's the principle of fellowship one with another. The city Jerusalem is compounded of that word. And it's the vision of peace. Not peace in the sense that the world will say we've got peace, but peace in the sense of complete fellowship with Yahweh. Now that is what he is, the Lord Jesus Christ will establish. A covenant of fellowship between Yahweh and his flock. And then he describes the work of the shepherd in verse 25. I will cause the evil beasts to cease out of the land. Remember how that David fought with the lion and the bear? Remember how he came to Saul and he said, the one that had protected him against the lion and the bear would protect him against this uncircumcised Philistines that dare defy the armies of the living God. What a glorious picture it is of that. Now here we have the good shepherd destroying the lion and the bear, destroying the evil beasts out of the land. And those terms evil beasts, of course, are used in its symbolical sense of the nation that in the seventh chapter of Daniel are referred to as beasts, wild beasts in the jungle of life. The shepherds, when they left the flock, virtually drove those sheep among the wild beasts of the world. And those wild beasts tore the flock. Now this good shepherd will come and he will cause the evil beasts to cease out of the land. The 38th chapter of Ezekiel will teach us how he's going to do that. They're going to be a, all the evil beasts are going to come down into the land of Israel for the final great judgment over the nation. And the shepherd priest, the prince, is going to destroy the evil beasts out of the land. And then we read, and they, the sheep, 
will dwell in the safety in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. And you have a beautiful pastoral seed in mind with the sheep asleep in the open spaces and in the woods, with the shepherd overlooking them as they recline upon the pasture in those places. A picture of complete peace that is presented here. That, that, that they are in no fear whatever. And so there is the principle of peace and security that will be established for his sheep. In verse 26, even more than that is done. There is a cessation of the drought, the spiritual drought that has existed down through the ages. Now in Amos chapter 8, verses 11 to 12, you can look this up at your leisure, you read how that Amos speaks of a famine and a drought that would come on the land. How the people would look everywhere for sustenance and for pasture. And he says it's not a drought of food or of water or a famine of food, but of hearing of the word of Yahweh. That's the true drought. That drought is in the earth at the present time. That drought is a, is rests upon the Israel sheep today. And who's going to break the drought? Who's going to bring showers of blessing? None other but the shepherd prince. I will make them, we read in verse 26, and the places around about my hill a blessing. And I will cause the shower to come down in his season. There shall be a blessing. And the picture is both spiritual and literal. There will be literally showers of blessing in the day of the millennium. But the picture is also symbolical, as Joel points out. When Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost, and they saw the manifestation of the Spirit. He said, this is a partial breaking of the spiritual drought. And he drew, drew attention to the words of Joel. So that the showers of blessing relate to the doctrines of truth that shall be presented in the age to come by the shepherd uh, prince, even the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result of this, as we read in verse 27, there shall be great fertility. Not merely in the literal sense, but in the spiritual sense. There will be great fruit to the glory of the Father in the age to come. The tree of the field shall yield her fruit, the earth shall yield her increase, and they shall be safe in the land, and shall know that I am Yahweh, when I have broken the bands of their yoke. And they were the very words used by Moses, the shepherd of Israel, in the 26th chapter of Leviticus, in verse 13 when he was speaking of the way that Yahweh broke the yoke of Egypt and brought them out and brought them into their own land. And here we have the terms again because this is a second exodus and Israel is to come out of spiritual Israel, a uh, spiritual Egypt to inherit the land. And there will be complete security because the shepherd prince will see to that. As David destroyed the lion and the bear, so the shepherd prince will cause every adverse influence to depart from his people. So we read in verse 28, They shall be no more a prey to the heathen, neither shall the beast of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely, and none shall make them afraid. And so we have a beautiful picture in those verses of the work of the shepherd prince over the people of Israel as he gathers them into the land, as they accept him as their shepherd, as he destroys the wild beasts out of the land, as he causes showers of blessing to come down upon it, as he provides them with a place of security and peace in the land. And so his people are looked after. But there's one beautiful spot in this prophecy that is brought out in verse 29. In the centre of that land, according to the figure it, figurative language of this chapter, there is a plantation of glorious trees. I will raise up for them a plant of renown. The words in the Hebrew are these, and make notice of them. Maralisha, a plantation to the name. Not a plant of renown, but a plantation to the name. The revised version renders it a plantation. So in the centre of the land there is a plantation to the name. Here are the saints. They are in the centre of the land. They are in the holy oblation. And they are a plantation to the name. They manifest the name of Yahweh in all the earth. And they pressed upon them, as the Lord Jesus Christ says in the third chapter of Revelation of verse 12, is the name of their God. 
And in the center of the land, there is this glorious plantation to the name. In the 60th chapter of Isaiah, and at verse 12, the prophet Isaiah speaks of this plantation. Uh, verse 21, I'm sorry, Isaiah 60, verse 21. Thy people also shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. There's the plantation to the name in the midst of the land of Israel. You know there's such a lot spoken of this theme throughout the scriptures. The name of Yahweh is the family name of the saints. We shelter in that name. The Lord Jesus Christ says in the 17th chapter of John, I have manifested thy name unto the men that thou gavest me. He goes on to pray, keep them in thy name. He goes on to say, I will declare thy name that thy love may be revealed. Malachi chapter 3 verse 16 says that they that think upon the name shall be mine. Isaiah 26 of verse 8 says, oh, my, The delight of my heart is in thy memorial name, and that is the family name that is named upon us. Paul says in the first of Thessalonians 1 verse 1, that they are the called out in Thessalonica that are in God and in the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our status. The name of Yahweh is over us. That name we can honour or dishonour. We must reveal the characteristics of that name. They must be revealed in a way of life. It must be patently obvious that we are moved by a power that stems from the Word of God. That God is being formed within us. And if that is not happening, brethren and sisters, we meet here completely in vain. It is to be his planting that he might be glorified. Abraham turned to the father and he says, I am but dust and ashes. What do you do with dust and ashes? If we were the heap of dust and ashes on here, what would we do with it? Pick it up and throw it out. That's us. Apart from the divine manifestation. But when we come to divine manifestation, we have something that will never be destroyed. Something that is glorious and perpetual and everlasting. And the divine character that we will, will reveal will find an inheritance in the kingdom of God. But if we've got nothing to offer the Father, then the dust and ashes, that which will happen to dust and ashes, will happen to us. It is to be a plantation to the name that is to be set up in the midst of the land. And as a result of this, they shall no more be consumed with hunger, verse 29 of Ezekiel 34, neither shall the shame of the heathen be any more upon Israel after the flesh, because the people, the plantation of the name, will feed them, feed them with knowledge. You know what uh, Jeremiah says in the third chapter of Jeremiah? He says that he, God is going to provide shepherds for Israel. He says in the third chapter of Jeremiah, verse 15, and I will give you pastors, according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and with understanding. They're going to feed as well with knowledge and with understanding. We are the pastors. We are the shepherds. We're learning like David did when he learned with the sheep, how to look after the, the nation. We're learning under the circumstances of everyday life, that we might be rulers in the age to come, and to feed those who will be mortals in the kingdom of God. And the circumstances of life reveal that unto us. And so, to summarise this chapter in verse 31, the prophet says, Ye are my flock, the flock of my pasture are men. And I am your God, said the Lord Yahweh. And he shows that this is symbolic. Now from there I want you to turn over to the 10th chapter of John, where this is summarised. In the 10th chapter of John you have the parable of the Good Shepherd. But you have more than that. You have two parables here. Confusion reigns because people look upon it as one parable only. You have the parable of the door, Christ as a door, verses 1 to 9, and the parable of Christ as a good shepherd, verses 10 to 18. Now if that is seen, you will see clearly this analogy that the Lord is setting forth before the Pharisees. He gives them this parable because these so-called shepherds had indicted one of their number. That horned him out of the way. 
That scattered him. They said, you keep out of the synagogue. You have that in chapter 9, and uh, it's enclosed in the verses of chapter 9. And the Lord gives them the parable of the good shepherd. First of all, he said, he is the door. And then he gives them the parable of the good shepherd. Now, I want you to notice particularly verse 1. He that entereth not by the door, but into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a sheep and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, eliminate the word the in your Bible. It shouldn't be there. It's the definite article, it's not in the Greek. The word should be a shepherd of the sheep. He that entereth by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. We must enter by the door. In other words, Jesus is telling the Pharisees, and he's telling us, and he's telling every shepherd in spiritual Israel, that a true shepherd is one that will bring the sheep to the door, bring them to Christ. A true shepherd is not one that's arguing all the time and scattering the flock and pulling it away. A true shepherd is one that carefully leads that flock to Jesus Christ, that reveals the Lord Jesus Christ to uh, the uh, people that are following him. He is a true shepherd who leads it to the door. And that door is the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in verse 17, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. And so a true shepherd will bring his flock to the porter that will open to him the door and he will come in to that fold which is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the first part, the Lord is the door. And then in the second part of this parable he says that he is also the good shepherd. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is unhighly and not the shepherd, his own the sheep are not, he seeth the wolf cometh and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. I will remember speaking to a brother, not in this country, on the responsibilities that rest upon leading brethren. This brother, by the way, was a sheep owner. And he had a very nice home, big glass windows, and you could look out upon the smiling paddocks outside and you could see the sheep in the paddock. But he reckoned, he reckoned that he should be strong in the word. And his manifestation of strength in the word was to keep He was going to be strong in the word. He wasn't going to stand any nonsense. And he told me one of the things that brethren had done and therefore they should be disfellowshipped and got rid of. And I looked at him and I said, have you ever read about the good shepherd? He said, yes, I read about the good shepherd and the holy. Yes. I said, you're acting the part of the holy. You're looking after yourself, not the shepherd. And I looked out the windows and I pointed to where some little lambs were. I said, look, if one of your little lambs got over that fence and there, were, if there was a fox there or an animal that might attack that, would you sit comfortably in this room here, look out of that window and say, well, there's wrecked a little thing. I've tried it 44 times up to get out of that fence. <laughs> All right, let the fox eat it. Would you do that? No, he said, I wouldn't. I said, no, you wouldn't because that cost you five pounds. <laughs> But your brother, let him get over that big beast in you. I said, if you were with us, and I said, if you could see the responsibilities that rest upon us, and if you stood shoulder to shoulder with us against the forces of error that we acknowledge are in the ecclesial world, combined, we would destroy every animal that would attack the flock. But I said, you're a highly, and you're going to flee because you're fighting of the wild beasts. That is the responsibility that rests upon us, brethren and sisters, both as shepherds or the flock. 